hope some of you can see it again because it, it does have a lot of information. I know that. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, it was a journey to make it. We, you know, I'm not going to tell you the usual story, but except it was difficult in the sense for me, I'm not a scientist, nor did I have any knowledge of this. Uh, Josh Goldstein here on my left was the uh, co-author of the book, knows a lot more about nuclear energy and can answer all your questions about it. But, and Josh has uh, been the backbone of this movie. I really believe that it had to be authentic, it had to be carried as much in tr truth to it because we're fighting one of the grotesque lies that we heard back in the 1970s, and my generation, many of you are mine, believed it. We believed it, and I feel very duped and stupid, but nobody planned it. it wasn't, I don't think it was done deliberately. I think it was part of our ignorance. Anyway, that starts the conversation. And you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think both of you guys for making this happen. Uh, we've been a big fans of your work uh, for a long time. And uh, great to have uh, uh, the movie come out. But clearly, the conversation is changing. Um, we've seen, um, you know, uh, folk who have previously been skeptical or previously been op oppose op opponents of nuclear power, kind of taking another look, as you said. But um, I guess the question to both of you: um, What do you think resonates most in? Uh, for people who are kind of on the fence, or people who are maybe uh, apprehensive. I'll let you deal with that. There's <laughs> <laughs> been a lot of misinformation, a lot of fear around the topic. So uh, I find that what resonates for people is to uh, learn information. This is what happened to me. I started out anti-nuclear. I've been an environmentalist all my life. And then I got concerned about climate change. Uh, and then I found that you can't really solve climate change without nuclear power, so that's too bad. I don't like it, but we're going to need it. And then I started to learn about it, and that's where the information comes in. Your eyes open up. You realize that a lot of what you know about a subject isn't true. And you want to learn about it, and then you see that it's a fantastic thing that we really <coughs> should be using, could be using. Um, and so that it's the, it's the hope that resonates more than anything. That there's all this climate change has just driven us all down into a kind of hopeless state because the things we're doing are not working. We know it's not working, right? That carbon emissions keep going up year by year. They're not going down quickly. And yet there are places like Sweden and France that have driven them down very quickly, 15, 20 years to just decarbonize the grid. So there's hope. And if the world would do these things, then we really could get a handle on this problem that just seems so overwhelming and so hopeless. So I'd say it's the, it's the hope that resonates. Uh, definitely. I mean, the um, climate uh, uh, apocalypse uh, fear, uh, there's a lot of kids, kids uh, who don't go to school because they are on strike um, and um, hopelessness. And I really appreciate you bringing back the human ingenuity, what we can achieve if we set our minds to it. Um, could you talk a little bit about the um, the storage side? So us, uh, as so uh, I'm from nuclear New York. We are advocates for reliable carbon-free energy, uh, including nuclear. But um, one of the oppositions, one of the questions we get is, you know, why do we bother with nuclear? The batteries are getting cheaper. Uh, I know you touched a little bit on the movie, but could you uh, quantify the scale? Because yeah, I think you quantified the solar and wind challenge. Um, to some extent, but maybe not the storage. Like, why is storage not going to save wind and solar? Yeah, so my co author on the book, Stefan Fist, uh, is a young Swedish nuclear engineer. He's great and he understands this stuff really well. He, and he's an energy systems analyst. He did a study a couple of years ago about the European continent and uh, how long a period does that entire continent go without wind or solar producing as much as 10% of their capacity? So you've got an entire continent with no wind and solar. And the answer was pretty regularly can go up to two weeks. Now, you think about the European continent with two weeks without that, you know, you're good, that's what the storage has to do, right? 
two weeks of energy for the European continent. And it's just orders of magnitude beyond anything we can do now with storage. Um, and there's no real plan to fill that gap. We know batteries are getting cheaper, and we know they're great in some applications <coughs> like electric vehicles. But the idea of powering the grid with them, nobody's ever done it. People have decarbonized with fission power. So you know that's a proven solution. But the idea that we're going to come up with a miracle battery, like Bill Gates says, a, a storage miracle, um, I hope so. But I, I doubt it, and I don't want to gamble our future on it. Thank you. Um, question about Fukushima. Uh, I think you touched on that in the book as well. Um, I was shocked. I was uh, um, very surprised when I first read that uh, nobody has died at Fukushima due to the nuclear accident, uh, and nobody will likely die from radiation exposure. But um, after I learned that, I um, I was very skeptical, so I had to go dig it up, and I had to go deep into UN uh, uh, documents, technical documents on health impacts of radiation, to to extract that quote that said, you know, zero uh, people have died. Uh, why isn't the nuclear industry screaming this from the top of the mountains? Why isn't that a well-known fact? Why isn't the nuclear industry their own advocate? Well, why do you think the Kennedy killing was ignored? I mean, it's some of the most absurd things happen, and we put up with it. It's the way the world works. It's sort of an enforced conformity, enforced feeling that we have to react this way. Yeah, nuclear disaster, what a ridiculous word. It was a uh, natural disaster from a hurricane, and a, uh, I mean, a tsunami, and an earthquake. That was what happened. But people don't know that. So this is part of the mythology that's been going on and on. It's time, it's time that someone called it out and just said, enough, this is bullshit. Because we're going to get to a crunch point. I have no illusions about where we're going. I, now that I know more than I used to, but it doesn't seem possible that the American political system will allow the will to change this thing, the course of this thing. I hope so. But you know, I know the stockbrokers, I'm cynical enough to know all the way the money works. We don't have that leadership. We don't have that possibility because we have a so-called democracy, pretty fragile one, and it's hard for a leader to take the, the necessary autonomy to say, let's go and do this. Just nobody can do that. So that's what I, uh, knowing that, I think that it's gonna reach a more, more of a crunch than ever. And I think in that crunch will be an interesting moment of pressure. And people will say, oh, what are we going to do now? Jesus Christ. We need more windmills? No. We're going to be screaming for nuclear. And it's going to be very, very short timing. You have to turn it out extremely fast. And there'll be an embracement of this extremity that we're talking about. Because once you start doing this, you can learn from it. And it gets better and better and better. But it'll be, it'll be rough, in my opinion. He may not agree with me at all. I'm telling you, I don't see America changing. I agree, but the, the thing with the Fukushima example, when, when people are scared, they don't think, well, none of us do. And, and we have a way of uh, compressing information when we're afraid and cross-wiring things. So, for instance, the Three Mile Island accident, we know nobody was hurt by it. But we had this movie going on in the theaters at the same time, and we got cross-wired. And same thing with Fukushima. Nobody was harmed by the low-level radiation that did escape from the plant. It basically worked. I know people who turned pro-nuclear after Fukushima because they realized that oh, that's a really safe plant to withstand a 100-foot tsunami and an earthquake and kill all these people, but not. But the nuclear plant didn't kill people, right? But then it's cross-wired because people are afraid. So you've got the scenes of devastation, the earthquake, the tsunami, it's all very scary and then you just drop nuclear power into there. Of course, the anti-nuclear organizations make a point of doing that, and they spend a lot of money to, to make these connections in our brain so that we'll be afraid. Um, I think they're, as Oliver says, probably well-intentioned, but also structurally, they raise a lot of money on this fear-mongering, and it's hard to, to change their minds about it. Yeah, I think the, uh, the origins of uh, Friends of the Earth uh, that was a shocking, uh, shocking revelation for myself as well, uh, as Rod Adams pointed out in the documentary. Um, 
and the money angle is real. I mean, it's. Um, uh, I don't think the fossil industry is funding anti-nuclear ads as much, but uh, being anti-nuclear is a, um, a profitable enterprise, and uh, being pro-nuclear isn't as much, no especially given the industry isn't really stepping up to kind of support uh, its speak for itself, at least in the U.S. Uh, maybe in Russia and China that's no. different. Russia, China, France, Sweden. There's a lot of countries that are doing this, you know, Hungary, now Poland, right? So this is not, and not, we're hoping Indonesia, we're really pushing there. We're going to Korea and to Japan. There's a lot of countries. We've got to start this process. Once it starts, once we build a little momentum, my God, it's going to go much faster than you think because it works. I would love if Hollywood would get on board with this uh, new attitude about nuclear because so far Hollywood has not been a friend of nuclear energy. If you're watching a Hollywood film and there's a nuclear power plant in it, it's not there to represent the hope of affordable, abundant electricity for poor people. Right? It's there to represent danger. And we have these whole series starting with, uh, I mean, Albert can talk about it. Yeah, well, with horror films of the 50s, that was huge for young people like those of us who remember. It's scary. Everybody that was. A horrible thing was mutation based on radiation. Radiation was the enemy. Everybody, radiation, my God, you couldn't. Mom would, you know, it's like drinking milk. You had to, you had to believe in it. <coughs> and the Rockefeller Foundation, as we found out, had a lot to do with it. It's very interesting that the first check written for a conservation company like uh, Friends of the Earth was written by uh, uh, the uh, Anderson, John Anderson of the uh, of the bank. Or 200,000 bucks, you know, that's a pretty, pretty significant factor. We don't know how much was spent, we don't know. We just learned a few days ago that Shell Oil buried all the information they had in the 1960s about climate change. They buried it. They knew it was going this way, and they went ahead and did it. So they, they benefited at the expense of the, of the public. This is going to be an interesting lawsuit. It's going to be the ultimate lawsuit of that year. So I think it could be a great, great scenario for a movie. I didn't think about it until now. <laughs> I'd love to you see heard it here. Shell oil. And then you, you cut to 139 lawyers on one side. And you cut to Paul Newman on the other, right? <laughs> and, and the star factor is a huge deal. I mean, you had um, Jane Fonda um, uh, arguing against nuclear and raising lots of money for it. Uh, recently, uh, by the way, Jane Fonda said, don't shut down Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, the last of California's. Uh, so that's, uh, we really see a change uh, happening across um, across the different political spectrums, across different areas of uh, government. The war in Europe is not, is helping propel the need for energy security. But could you talk a little bit about uh, the um, getting more star power behind nuclear, like obviously, uh, you know, people like um, yourself making a movie uh, is a big deal, but um, what, what can, uh, how can we get more um, Hollywood stars or um, other? I, I, I would forget that. I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a herd mentality and it follows herds. You know. They don't, you gotta be scientific over faith. You can't, you can't. What was it? The, the, what's the senator? I forgot his name. Uh, Ted Cruz. Oh, it's a matter of faith over facts. It's the opposite. Uh, but it's impossible. You know, we have a certain amount of morons in this country. They were born there, and we're stuck. We curse on it. And the stupider the president gets, which is happening, if you look at George Bush, from Ronald Reagan to George Bush was bad enough. From George Bush to to Biden, well, you know, you may not agree with me, but it's really getting to the level of caveman, caveman. Uh, so we're not getting out of this hole that we're in. America is not educated. And then the stupidest of stupid is Hollywood, right? But it's not stupid because if you're a Hollywood producer and you want to fill this theater night after night, and you can put a radiation horror film mutation, you know, monsters or a, a, a whistleblower who tells you that actually millions of people died at Chernobyl or something, it brings people in because fear sells movies. Fear sells newspapers. People like horror movies, they want to see them. 
So no matter what you really know, you want to believe that that monster exists. Isn't that possible? And the best... Uh, we like to be scared. We like to be scared. And the scariest is the kind of the, the bomb, right? It's the uh, And you can use that uh, calculation pretty effectively. Yeah. Well, they got that confounded at the very beginning. Yeah. The problem with nuclear energy is the most one of the most miracles of our modern age. Marie Curie ought to be a saint, as far as I'm concerned. I would vote for her. Uh, she is great, and Einstein, and Fermi, and all these people, they followed in his footsteps, and they knew that this was special energy. They knew it was there from the beginning of time, and we didn't know about it. That shows you it took 5,000 years to discover it. Then we found it, and of course a war breaks out at the same time, and we use the, we use the uranium to build bombs. What a great start. You know, we didn't do it right. We had bad luck. And Who so knows if there's a destiny behind us. Like it's interesting to learn that saints are now going to be chosen by Oliver Stone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we are out of time, but I wanted to uh, uh, say um, one, one thing is that um, um, uh, we are um, trying to move the needle forward, and we have um, these gummy bear packs for you guys to take, each representing a uranium fuel pellet, which can power you for um, three to five years, depending on the technology. Uh, so, uh, and the other um, other point is, um, we have, so uh, so it took me, so I, mean, I watched uh, uh, Inconvenient Truth nearly two decades ago now, and I thought that, um, okay, this is scary, but I'm sure the, um, adults in the room will figure this out. And um, they haven't. And I realized uh, uh, a decade later that there are no adults. I just have to step in and be part of the solution. So one thing I would ask uh, our audience here, if you are so inclined, uh, we have postcards to send our governor, Kathy Hochul, uh, to ask for nuclear power in our climate plan, which currently the, is only a which somehow excluded nuclear inexplicably. Uh, so we'd like to change that. So if any of you don't know nuclear, we are they're doing great work uh, in the state and have uh, written plans and proposals how to repower the state of New York with uh, nuclear energy as the backbone of the energy system, not something you kind of sprinkle on top of everything else you're doing. And I think it's a great group and uh, honored to have you here with us.